Honda recently lent me one of their new Africa Twins for a few weeks, and that gave me the chance to do all sorts of riding on it, commuting, motorways, twisty lanes, and a bit of off-roading. Honestly, I thought it was a cracking bike in pretty much all of those settings, but by the time I took it back, I felt like it was perhaps a bit short on spec for the price. So in today's video, I'll tell you why, but before we get underway, if you're new here and you want to see more reviews like this, as well as the latest motorcycle news, then please do remember to hit subscribe. I'll start with the good stuff, and my favourite thing about this bike was the engine. For 2020, the 270 degree parallel twin has gone from 998cc to 1084, and along with a bunch of other changes like larger throttle bodies, revised injector angles, new valve timing, and increased valve lift, they've managed to squeeze an extra 6 horsepower and 6 Nm of torque out of it with a peak of 100 horsepower at 7,500 revs and 105 Nm at 6. 6,250. And that's all while keeping it Euro 5 compliant. Although these figures aren't astronomical, it was plenty enough for the sort of riding that I was doing, and what I liked about it more was the feel. In the right power mode, the connection between the throttle and the engine was a delight, and Honda's gearboxes are so satisfying to use as well. This base model is the off-road focus variant and comes with relatively few frills, so there's no quick shifter as standard, but I didn't really feel like it needed one just a slight pull on the lightweight slipper clutch and it knocks into the next gear so easily and with total precision every single time. And I love the exhaust note too, the stock can uses the same exhaust control valve as you get on the Fireblade, which opens up as the revs climb to help the engine breathe more freely. But Honda also claimed that it's responsible for a distinctive pulsing note lower down the revs. Got a nice rasp to it. Yeah, it's pretty good. I really grew to like the sound of this bike, especially as you accelerate hard through the low to mid range. I enjoyed riding the Africa Twin wherever I took it. I'm not the best off-road rider by any stretch of the imagination, but I don't mind having a go. It rained a lot in the few weeks that I had the bike with me, but on one of the good days, I took it to some local gravel roads, although you can still see there are a few puddles. I parked it across the lane to take some photos for my Instagram, and I have to admit, a big bike like this is difficult to maneuver at low speed on even slightly uneven terrain, despite having shed five kilograms versus last year's model. It's still 226 kilograms curb, but once you roll in, it's a really easy bike to ride and it feels planted and reassuring. The standing position is comfy with taller risers than the road-focused Adventure Sports model, and the seat is substantially narrower than the last model by 40 millimeters, so it's easier to reach the floor, as well as feeling quite nimble for such a big bike. The revised slipper clutch has a light feel which helps when you're constantly feathering it, and there are both gravel and off-road riding modes with slightly different power delivery, as well as the option to disable torque control and ABS. The suspension was more than ample for the light off-roading I was doing, and even the stock Metzler Carry Street tyres weren't bad either. I'd sum up my short gravel ride on the Africa Twin as confidence-inspiring, and the big torquey engine has a great feel in that environment. There's always a bit of motorway slog involved with press bikes like this, whether that's heading up to the Midlands to collect or return them, or getting out of London to find somewhere decent to test. I loved having CarPlay on hand for this stuff because I'd much rather navigate with Waze than a built-in sat-nav. It has motorcycle-specific ETAs and traffic data which tend to be the most accurate in my experience, so it's nice to be able to have that on the 6.5-inch TFT, as well as the option to control it from the switch gear. There's cruise control as standard on all models now, which takes a little fatigue out of the longer stretches of motorway, as does the riding position. The seat can be set at either 850 or 800. 70 millimeters, as well as there being low and high options as accessories. I found the 850 seat height good around town where I might want to get my feet down quickly, but the 870 millimeter setting on the longer stretches of motorway opens up the knee angle and feels less cramped. Combined with the tall risers for standing off-road, it all makes a pretty nice relaxed position. 
Once the roads get a bit more interesting, it's plenty of fun too. Of course, it's no sports bike, but the four-pot Nissins are easily good enough for what's possible with a tall bike like this. The suspension felt decent, and there's full adjustability at the front and preload and rebound on the shock. And as you'd expect from a 2020 bike like this, there are plenty of rider aids on hand, with a six-axis IMU enabling cornering ABS, wheelie control and rear wheel lift control, as well as torque control, power levels and engine braking control. There's also also two user-defined riding modes on top of the four preset modes so that you can dial in your exact preference. So there's a lot to like as I said at the top and I really loved the big talky twin with that pulsing engine note. But it wasn't long before I got this bike that I'd been on the launch of the Triumph Tiger 900 and it got me thinking about where the Africa twin is positioned in the market. In terms of capacity it's halfway between the middleweights like the Tiger, F850 GS, 950 Multistrada and KTM 790 and the larger capacity capacity adventure bikes like the 1250 GS, 1260 Multistrada and 1290 Adventure. At £13,049 for this base model though, the pricing is more in line with the big bikes where the 1250GS range for example starts at £13,850. For comparison, the Tiger 900 starts at £9.5 grand, and for £13,100, so almost the exact same price as the Africa Twin, you get the range topping Rally Pro. And so with that premium pricing of the Honda, I think I was expecting a bit more spec and attention to detail. Take the screen for a start, it's the off road bias version so they've put a short screen on it so that you can still see over it when it gets muddy. But it's essentially like riding a naked bike on the motorway and for any stretch of time it's not much fun. An adventure bike has to do a bit of everything otherwise you just buy a proper off roader so why not put an adjustable screen on it so that you get the best of both worlds. Up on the motorway for wind protection, down for riding trails. I'm borrowing an XADV from Honda at the moment and that has a pretty good one so why not on the Africa twin, the only option you've got is to buy the 115 quid tall screen accessory. The cheaper XADV also comes with full hand guards, but on the Africa twin, you get some knuckle guards and then pay 25 quid for some extensions to turn them into full hand guards. It just feels a bit cheeky on a 13 grand bike. Then there are a few usability quirks with the tech. CarPlay only works if you've got a Bluetooth headset paired, which is a pain if you don't have one, or like to use more than one helmet. I actually just connected the pod from my Senna headset set and put it in my pocket to get around this, but I'd rather not have to. And also, I'm not entirely convinced about the USB port placement. Part of the joy of CarPlay is not having your phone mounted on the bars, but because the port is on the dash, you end up having to use a phone mount anyway, with the cable flapping around in the wind. Couldn't it have been tucked away somewhere neater and more weatherproof for that matter? I don't think I'm the first to say that the menus are a bit tricky to use and they certainly require some time to learn. But I also felt the design of the screens lacked a bit of drama, especially with the white background. I said this in my first impressions video, it looks like a piece of medical equipment rather than a motorbike. It does look better with the black background setting and that's what I stuck with for most of the time, but still, it could be more exciting. And then the cruise control, a great feature no doubt, but why like the Goldwing put it on the right hand switch gear and at such a stretch from the throttle that you have to momentarily let go of it to hit the set button. It makes it difficult to get the exact speed you're looking for and you end up having to trim it straight away with the up and down button. I rode the Indian FTR 1200S recently, not exactly a motorway bike, but it had sensible cruise control placement on the left hand switch gear and within the reach of even my stubby little thumbs. And like I was saying, having ridden the Tiger 900 Rally Pro recently at almost exactly the same price point, Triumph have proved that you can offer a lot more spec. It has an adjustable screen, for example, which you can operate with one hand so that you can make adjustments without having to pull over. You get full handguards too, so combined, the wind protection on the motorway is pretty good. There's a waterproof box under the saddle with a USB port inside for stashing your phone. Crash bars come as standard on this off-road bias model, whereas there are 290 quid option on the Africa Twin. Peripheral lights are standard, but a 405 quid option on the Honda, as well as needing those 290 quid crash bars to them on. A quick shifter comes as standard on the Tiger, 695 on the Africa Twin. There's tyre pressure monitoring, 
heated grips and heated rider and passenger seats with separate controls, all as standard. And I would even argue that the finish is better on the Tiger with a bit more of a quality feel to the components and in the cockpit. Now, you could argue that the Africa Twin is a bigger bike and therefore you'd expect fewer gadgets and accessories for your money because you're paying for the extra capacity. But despite an extra 200 cc's, it's only 100 horsepower to the Tiger's 94. Being a twin, it does have plenty more torque with 105 Newton meters versus 87, but it's not worlds apart. So in the end, I concluded that in pricing the Africa Twin up near the big adventure bikes, it looks slightly underpowered compared to the 136 horsepower of the 1250 GS or 160 horsepower of the 1290 Super Adventure, for example. And at the same time, it's under spec compared to a middleweight, so it kind of just falls somewhere in the middle. All of this is not to say that it's a bad bike at all. I I've already said that it feels great off-road, it's fun to ride on the twisties and with a bit more wind protection it'd be a nice place to soak up some big miles. I had a blast borrowing it from Honda and genuinely didn't want to give it back, but would I buy one for 13 grand? Probably not.